why the latest climate conference in Glasgow continues. Many world leaders have left, including Scott Morrison. There were more pledges made. 85% of the world's economies are now pledging net zero at some point, either 2050 or slightly later. But the world is still not on track for the 1.5 degrees uh, limitation of warming that was hoped for. Joining me live now, my panel, Liberal MP Jason Valinsky and the Labor Party, Patrick Gorman. Thanks both for your time. Jason, I'll start with you on this. Australia didn't sign up to the pledge to reduce methane by 2030. Australia did not increase at all its target by 2030 of reducing emissions. Compared to similar countries, are we now a laggard? Um, well, which similar countries are you referring to? Oh, UK, US, well, you, many well, other countries respect, in Europe. UK, sorry, UK, who, who else? US, many other countries in Europe. OK, so the UK is nothing like Australia. Uh, Australia has um, three very key sectors, which are, are our mining, energy and agricultural sectors. We have unusually large... They form un unusually large parts of our economy. The capacity for us, therefore, to reduce our emissions is hampered by that fact that our economy is so dependent on those three sectors. The UK has nothing like that. So it's not okay, fair well, to compare well, Australia to the UK... Similar? Despite, well, similar, well, there isn't actually US? really a country. In energy, you would look at Saudi Arabia. Or in mining, you would look at South Africa. In agriculture, you might look at Chile or Argentina. Um, these are, you know, we have, we are quite unique. Despite that, we have reduced our emissions by 20%, which is more than double of Germany, more than um, double of France, um, more than double of so many, more than double the United States. 2030 so is the focus. Many of the nations we, we, we have beaten others to sit by on land us use. In judgment. And it's land use oh, and sorry, land Tom, clearing I, alone that gets I, I us there. I was interrupting you, interrupting me. What was that? 2030 is the focus here, though. That's what we're talking about. Yep. It's how many, so how we, much we've updated, will be out there in well, the future? Yeah, sure. So we've updated our projections to 35%. Um, I know okay. your next question is going to be, but what about a target? We took a target to the last election of 28%. The Labor Party took a target of 45%. It's the view of the Prime Minister of the Cabinet that um, we should stay true to the promises that we made to Australia at the last election. Um, despite that, we are now exceeding our targets and hopefully we can actually get those projections um, even higher or lower, depending on which way you want to look at it. Pat, do you see Australia as a laggard? I believe Australia is missing out on a lot of opportunities. If we do more in terms of moving with the world to act on climate change, that will mean more jobs for Australia and a bigger economy for Australia. And on the, uh, I've got to pick up Jason when he talked about the big parts of the Australian economy. The big one that he missed out was, of course, education a huge export for Australia, where under this government over the last few years, we've seen 40,000 job losses. Uh, and of course, education and working with our academics, our researchers, our innovators, is part of how we are gonna find all of the solutions to this climate change challenge that we have. Um, so, um, look, I think the real problem okay. that Australia so had during these... I will let you interrupt, Tom. I don't mind, it's your show. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Patrick's trying to get extra points. Well, let me ask you, this. you, you mentioned they're doing more. Australia should be doing more. Does that, yeah. by definition, mean a higher target in 2030 than the government is projecting it will get to? Well, we've always said, Tom, that at the conclusion of the Glasgow conference, between then and the election, Labor will outline our plans. Uh, I'm not in a position to do that today, but we're watching this closely. My colleague, Pat Conroy, is there in Glasgow now, unlike the Prime Minister, he hasn't flown out early. Uh, Patrick is there, he's representing us, seeing what the global commitments are and working on how we make sure we can uh, integrate that into the policy that we will take to the next election. OK, but, but you said doing more. Doing more would have to yeah. be more than the coalition. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, I believe... Look, let's, let's be clear here. It's been just a week... <laughs> That the coalition that's a pretty has had a yeah, to sure, zero but you were the ones saying doing more. Well, that's a good question, Tom. Yeah. And she kept and asking questions about doing more. Tom. Here's some things that we have already outlined. Uh, Labor has already outlined that we will legislate to net zero by 2050. That's more than what the coalition will do. We've said that we'll put wow. a 20 billion dollar financing facility together 
to rewire the nation so that we can actually plug in more renewables into the grid. That's doing more than the coalition. We'll cut taxes on electric cars. Something that, uh, you know, Jason normally runs around saying that he wants to cut taxes everywhere. The only Absolutely. place they don't want to cut taxes is electric cars. And I want to know why. Jason, you can... Uh, well, okay. that. Uh, yeah, look, I agree with Pat on, on two of those things there. One is I do think that there is a lot of work we can do on our transmission um, network. And, um, you know, I, th I think that's something that we should be looking at. And, look, I'm, I'm on the record of saying that I think we should take um, EVs or electric vehicles and also hydrogen cell vehicles out of the luxury car tax net to encourage and incentivise people um, to, do, to right. um, you know, purchase those cars sooner rather than later. Be early adopters, I want to get onto an... if you will. I want to get onto another topic. Of course, this is totally hypothetical, nothing to do with what's happening at the moment. But, Jason, is it a good idea for a world leader, if they are struggling to maybe um, prove their point on something, to leak text messages that have been sent between them and another world leader? Well, hypothetically speaking, uh, Tom, I think you would also have to add to that, do you think it's a good idea for one world leader to call another a liar just because they lost potentially, I don't know, a deal because they weren't delivering what they promised they would. Do you think, it, hypothetically, it's a good idea for... Well, let's reverse this. Do you think it's a good idea for the Australian ambassador in Paris to go to the equivalent of the National Press Club and just, you know, give a giant spray about the government of France? I mean, it is quite extraordinary, but it's not matched, frankly, by the extraordinary fact that the Australian media has been cheering them on as they did it. I mean, I just... I, okay, and what about I'm the question I so, so, so you're saying... ..at the behaviour of the Australian media... ..given what an, Emmanuel while Macron an said... in our country whose job is okay. to actually engender good relations with the government so, so, goes and just so given, slags off that government. All right, Jason. So given what Emmanuel Macron said, Scott Morrison, you're saying, yeah. was entitled to leak... Text oh, so we've moved to, off hypothetical, have we? Of course we have. <laughs> OK. Um, look, uh, yes, I do. I honestly do. I mean, there comes a point where I think the Australian government for about a month um, said, look, we understand that the French are upset. We understand that they're going to have uh, some negative things to say about us. But I think when Emmanuel Macron goes off the deep end and proceeds to say, oh, no, they lied to us, and it wasn't, you know, I know the media is trying to paint this as, oh, no, he was just talking about Scott Morrison. He was talking about the entire Australian government and the military establishment had lied to them, even though there was publicly available information All right. that he, we had been He was very clearly saying it wasn't the Australian people, which the PM did say he won't cop on behalf of all Australians. So, but, you know, there was an example. Well, I mean, when there. you're attacking Pat, our, our military, I mean, that's, you know, anyway. All right, Pat, um, what's your... Uh, so, is an Australian Prime Minister entitled to go public when they're called a liar? Well, I think Scott Morrison's acting a bit like a sulking teenager. He's running around refusing to wear his mask. He's leaking text messages from people he, who used to be his friends. I mean, um, it's pretty immature stuff. And that's my biggest concern, is that here we have an Australian Prime Minister on the world stage behaving like a sulking teenager uh, because things people are saying mean things about him. Um, and some of those seem to be demonstrably true because it's not just... Uh, uh, the French are saying about our Prime Minister, it's what Malcolm Turnbull is saying about our Prime Minister. That was an extraordinary intervention from the former Prime Minister yesterday where he said that he knows that Scott Morrison is a liar and has a reputation for lying. I mean, um, this, is a, this, this is a pattern of behaviour as opposed to a one-off spat. So, look, I, I don't know if it was the right decision. Uh, it's the Prime Minister's phone. He can... He can cancel subcontracts on his phone. He can leak text messages. That's up to him. Uh, but it's a pretty weird standard right. that he's going to set in his own party room uh, that he's now We've basically gotta... said, yep, everyone, let's leak our text messages. Let's get it all out there. Um, it's going to be a wild ride for the next few months. Sounds like an excellent policy to me. Uh, leaked messages always welcome on the Newsday program. If you're out there, politicians, you probably know my number. We'll have to leave it there. I should point out, I think it's a Polish flag, not a French one in your background, Jason. No, no, it's French. It's French. It is it's French. French. It's a French... Yeah, well, yeah, got yeah. The French There's flag a story up. behind it, if you want to know, but I know you've run out of time. I'm going to get in trouble. We'll, we'll, we'll detail it. Next week, you'll hear the story behind the French flag in Jason Polinsky's office. Tune in, tune in. You won't want to miss it. <laughs>
Patrick, thank you.